beneficiaries, opioids and benzodiazepines. All participants joining the webinar today are in listen and view only mode. After the presentation, there will be a question and answer session and you can submit a question at any time during the webinar. To do so, please type your question into the Q&A box located at the bottom center of your Zoom screen. You may need to move your cursor or tap your touchscreen device to see it. This webinar is being recorded today and it will be available on the NADA website in coming days. I'm Sun, I'm the Project Support Officer at NADA and I'll be facilitating today's presentation. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I'm situated today, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation. We pay respects to elders past, present and future. For those of you only joining the series today, this webinar series is presented by Annie Bleeker. Annie has worked in the HIV and AIDS, alcohol and other drug sector for the past 30 years. She's lived and worked in the Netherlands for five years, implementing peer education programs for people who use drugs. And she's also spent two years working in Indonesia, training community workers on how to respond to alcohol and drug issues and preventing transmission of HIV. She's taught at several universities in Sydney and currently works as a senior training specialist for ATOTA, not a sister agency in the ACT. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Annie. Awesome. Is that working now? Can everyone see that? Okay, good morning everybody and thank you very much Sun and welcome to the fourth webinar uh, and for those people who have been with us for the last three weeks, um, this is the final one and uh, I hope it's uh, useful and provides you with um, some information um, that's relevant for your clients. Uh, like uh, Sun, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners on whose beautiful land we're meeting today. Um, I'm speaking to you from um, Bunjalung country up in the Northern Rivers. So unlike many people um, that are probably online today, I'm not in lockdown. So uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the um, difficulty that many of you will be experiencing with another month of this. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians on the land which I'm meeting and also extend that to everybody else who's on Aboriginal land in uh, wherever you are. And I'd like to pay respects to elders, families and ancestors and extend that especially to any Aboriginal people online. I'd also like to acknowledge the many people with lived experience, be it with alcohol and drugs and or mental health. So as Sun said, um, what we're going to cover today is I'm going to provide you with a bit of an update on uh, opioid drugs um, and also benzodiazepines um, and provide you with some harm reduction information uh, relating to these drugs. We're also going to spend a bit of time talking about overdose prevention, um, particularly the use of naloxone. Uh, and um, this is a, a real uh, lifesaver for anyone who's using opioid drugs. Uh, and where we have that information uh, and advice relating to harm reduction um, relating to COVID, I, um, I encourage you to look at the New South Wales Users and AIDS Association because they've got some great posters uh, available um, uh, online. So just to set the scene, and as Sun said, we've got some polls. So this is our first poll today. Um, and I will just launch that now so that people can um, answer that. So there was a, um, a study, um, oh, hold on, this is the wrong poll. Please don't answer that one, my apologies. Got the wrong one. So um, there was a study conducted in 2012 by AVOL, the Australian Injecting and Illicit Drug Users League, that found that what proportion of people who inject drugs experience discrimination and stigma in healthcare settings. Um, sorry, I didn't launch that poll. So is that 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, 100%? .80%? If you could answer that, I'll leave it open for another 15 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end polling now. Thank you for all of those of you who voted. Um, so um, congratulations um, for those of you who picked 80%. So that's four out of every five people who inject drugs experience some form of discrimination in healthcare um, settings, which is really, um, really uh, problematic. Uh, and it basically, it stops them from um, seeking treatment earlier and, um, and help when they need it. 
So um, a study that was conducted by um, Lisa Maher and colleagues in 2008 uh, found that there were approximately, estimated that there were approximately 200,000 people that currently inject drugs in Australia. And as a group, people who inject drugs experience a greater range of health and social disparities and unique health outcomes comparative to the general population. Um, and you can see here that they're far more at higher risk of fatal overdoses and bloodborne infections and diseases like HIV uh, and hepatitis uh, C and uh, B, and also much earlier deaths. Uh, and they're a highly stigmatised uh, group of people and they experience significant discrimination, not only by the community, but as we saw also in, um, in uh, public health settings, in healthcare settings. Just want to refresh um, with, um, uh, an overdose report that is, um, was released by the Pennington Institute. They have a really great summary on their website if you'd like to find out more about that. But in 2018, it was estimated that over 2,000 people had un uh, unintentionally overdosed in Australia. And this is over 400 people more than die of um, car accidents uh, or on the road every year. Um, in the last sort of 10 or so years, there have been a significant rise in deaths involving heroin. So for those of you who might have been in the sector for a while, you might remember around 2000, we saw a huge reduction in the amount of heroin coming into this country. Um, that's starting to, um, to um, increase quite significantly. Uh, a very good friend of mine works at MSIC um, and uh, sort of was saying that it's usually about 50-50 people use heroin uh, as well as other opioid drugs and it changes depending. So um, while COVID was on last year, there, were, there was a reduction in the amount of heroin that was available, but this seems to be um, back uh, as um, back on board, like also uh, crystal methamphetamine. We have seen an increase in synthetic opioid deaths. So um, this is a particular drug called fentanyl. Um, and this is what's causing a lot of the opioid overdose deaths in America. And we have over half a million people that have died of um, opioid deaths in, a, in the US since 1999. Um, and they had a um, huge increase uh, of this, particularly uh, during COVID, whereas we saw a reduction in overdose deaths uh, last year. We are seeing an increasing amount of drug-induced deaths involving psychotropic medicines, so benzodiazepines and antipsychotics and non-opioid uh, medications used for the treatment of certain pain conditions. So um, proglobalam or Lyrica, which is used to treat strong nerve pain. Um, we're also seeing violence in alcohol. Um, so a lot of poly uh, substance use overdose deaths. Uh, and usually these involve four or more substances. Um, and what's very interesting is we've seen um, a quite in uh, increased uh, uh, overdose deaths in regional areas in Australia. So if we look in comparison um, to um, 1999, so in 20 years, you can see that in um, 2019, a person mo more likely dying of a drug-induced overdose in Australia was more likely to be a middle-aged male living outside of a capital city with prescription drugs such as benzos and oxycodone um, detected at death. And the death was more likely to be accidental. Um, whereas uh, just before the, um, the heroin drought in Australia in 1999, a person who died of a drug overdose was uh, more likely to be a person in their 30s with morphine and heroin and or benzodiazepines detected at death. So one of the big concerns we have at the moment is the amount of pharmaceutical opioids um, being detected in deaths in Australia. And about 70% of those um, overdose deaths are involving pharmaceutical opioids. Over opioids. So what are the risk factors for overdose? Well, basically, as many of you probably know, working in the field, if you mix um, opioids or, um, with benzodiazepines and or alcohol or any central nervous system depressant drug, um, you're more likely to um, uh, experience an uh, overdose. We also see a lot of people um, uh, 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 having an overdose death after they've been discharged from withdrawal or from hospital, because basically they haven't been uh, using drugs for a while. If they've been to detox or rehabilitation, um, or if they've um, been to prison or just released from prison. So the 
highest risk factor for overdose of people reduced from pre, uh, released from prison is the first two weeks after they've um, been released. Uh, so again, it's really important that we give drugs like naloxone to them to avoid overdose. Injecting is far more risky as far as um, overdose compared to um, either smoking the drug or swallowing the drug or snorting the drug. Um, if people use much more of the drug or have a higher purity of the drug um, than usual, they're also more likely to overdose. Uh, using alone, it's often uh, been associated with overdose because obviously there's nobody around to call for help uh, or to administer or to call for an ambulance. Um, also, if people have other health problems, and we see this very much with uh, older drug users who might have been uh, using um, for 20 or so years, they may well have major infections or respiratory or liver disease um, or their lungs uh, might have been, um, you know, uh, uh, um, impacted by their use of uh, drugs or, and or smoking. So they're also more likely to overdose. So we're seeing much more overdose deaths in people over the age of 40. Um, we also find more increases in um, overdose deaths in people that are using it in unfamiliar places or they're buying drugs from an unknown dealer um, or on the street um, or um, different, uh, an unknown location or with other um, people. So what are the consequences um, of overdose? So um, one of the things that we find with um, overdose deaths is that brain damage can occur quickly um, with overdose, and this can happen through a lack of oxygen. So the brain consumes 20% of our oxygen despite being only 2% um, of our body weight. And there are two types of um, injuries, brain injury can have been caused by lack of oxygen. And this is one of them is called a hypoxic brain injury, and this is caused by reduction in the um, in the blood in the oxygen supply. Um, but there's also an oxic uh, brain injury where there's a complete lack of oxygen to the brain. We're also seeing um, permanent um, muscle or nor nerve injury or fascicle compartment um, syndrome, which is a serious condition that occurs when a, there's a large amount of pressure on the um, inside of the muscle compartment. Um, we also see um, kidney failure can happen um, due to rheumatosis, uh, the breaking down of skeletal uh, medicine causing the release of um, myoglobin in the, in the drug, in the, uh, into the blood. Um, and the increase of, um, and, the, it, and, uh, and uh, the muscle, muscle breakdown causes the release of myoglobin into the bloodstream and it's the protein that stores oxygen in your muscles. And if you have too much myoglobin in the blood, it can cause um, kidney damage. There's also obviously psychological trauma that can happen um, through overdose. So that's either people witnessing that or otherwise they're experienced that. And obviously the worst um, outcome of an overdose is death. Um, and as I said, these, these are increasing in Australia. Just wanna talk about pharmaceutical opioids because these have been contributing to a lot of overdose deaths in Australia. Many people um, will probably um, have heard about what's happening in America, and we're certainly sort of seeing a mirroring of this happening in Australia, although we tend to be about 10 years behind what's happening in the US. But we have seen the dispensing of pharmaceutical opioids uh, increase 15 fold from the mid 90s to 2015. So in 20 years, seen a you know, 15 fold increase. And we saw a marked shift in this time from weak short acting opioids like codeine to more of the half a dispensing becoming the strong lofting, uh, stronger long acting opioids like oxycodone. And with increased um, opioid utilization, we're seeing increases in the amount of people that are going to hospital um, or, um, or um, seeking treatment for opioid problems and also increasing overdose. So pharmaceutical opioids collectively cause about 70% of opioid overdoses in Australia, which is very much, as I said, which is happening in the US. Um, and as I said, we have over half a million people that have died in the US um, from uh, opiate overdose. And a lot of this is caused um, by fentanyl. So this was a slide I presented in the um, first session, but I just thought it was worthwhile um, uh, just repeating for those of you who might not have uh, seen it. So this is from the Australian NSP survey from 2018. Uh, the 2019 survey basically looked at um, what was happening over 20 years. So I just thought this was more um, relevant to, to those of you um, that are working um, with people who inject drugs. 
So about one in five people who, um, and this survey is conducted in uh, needle and syringe programs during a couple of weeks uh, in the, every year. So you can see that one in five uh, attendees identified as Aboriginal. Uh, the average age of NSP attendees was about 41 years old. Um, and you can see um, this group had, um, you know, was quite disadvantaged and marginalised. So one in four had experienced homelessness, one in five reported a mental health issue, uh, one in 10 uh, reported being in prison, and one in four was pres uh, prescribed opiate substitution therapy. Um, one in two reported that the drug that they'd injected most recently was opioids, um, so 34 um, uh, said it was uh, heroin and 1% was fentanyl. And one in three reported that the drug that they most recently injected was methamphetamine um, and cocaine was about 2%. So this isn't a huge problem here yet, but as I talked about in last uh, week's session, uh, we are seeing a lot more cocaine coming into Australia. So we can expect that this might also increase. About one in seven reported injecting steroids um, drugs, uh, about uh, almost just under half reported injecting daily or more. And um, despite the fact that we've had needle and syringe programs uh, in Australia since, 19, since the mid eighties, about one in five reported sharing injecting equipment in the um, previous 12 months, in the previous month, sorry. And one in four reported um, having overdosed in the previous 12 months. So that's very significant. And almost um, one in two reported that they'd had hepatitis C and again, um, there's some amazing treatments available for hepatitis C. So if you are working with clients that um, are injecting, it's worthwhile talking to them about hepatitis C treatment because um, this is um, a real game changer. And as I said um, in the first session, you don't need to be not um, using drugs to be um, able to access these drugs, which is something unique that Australia does, um, which is a good thing. Okay, we've got a poll here about fentanyl. And as I said, this is a drug that is causing a lot of problems um, in, um, in the US. Uh, okay, um, all right. So, oh, sorry, sorry, guys, I'm a bit out of practice with this. Okay, number two. So on average, how much stronger is fentanyl compared to morphine? Is it uh, 20 times stronger, 100 times stronger, 1,000 times stronger, or 10,000 times stronger? So fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, and it's um, basically been around uh, since it was discovered in about 1976, um, but it really started to become popular in, uh, in the mid-90s. Okay, I'll leave a few more seconds for those of you who haven't answered. Okay, and I'm going to end polling and I'll share the results. Congratulations for those of you who picked 100 times stronger. You are correct. It's estimated to between, be between um, 80 to 100 times stronger. Um, so thank you for answering that one. Okay, sorry, up to 100 times stronger. Well done. Okay, just to just give you a bit of an example about this. So you can see how much fentanyl you would, this, this is about the amount of fentanyl you would need compared to the same amount of heroin. Uh, there is a uh, calf fentanyl, uh, which is used to tranquilize elephants is 10,000 times stronger. Um, and this has also been found in the drug supply uh, in America, um, not so much here yet. Um, but a lot of um, this comes from China. So our proximity um, to China means that we do have um, some fentanyl uh, uh, coming in. Um, we don't have as much of it in our market um, as uh, the Americans do, but this is certainly, fentanyl is certainly causing a lot of the drug related uh, uh, deaths uh, in America. So when we're talking about um, opioids, these are the um, drugs that we're talking about. So heroin and opium um, are sort of, uh, uh, I guess, what we would call, um, uh, um, what is it, uh, natural opioid drugs and codeine and morphine. As we go down the list, we can see sort of semi-synthetic um, opioid drugs, and these ones are starting to get a lot stronger. Um, and a lot of these ones started to um, really come into play in the mid-90s. Um, and you can see here how much stronger fentanyl and carfentanyl um, is. 
So these are uh, basically a class of depressant drugs. So depressant drugs slow down the, um, the blood and the breathing, and that's why they're very dangerous for overdose. So heroin um, or the, the um, natural opioids come from the opium poppy. And when you take heroin, it um, changes into morphine in this sort of system. We've got synthetic opioids such as fentanyl and methadone, um, and then prescription pain medications such as oxycodone and oxycontin, um, and then hydrocodone, uh, morphine and codeine. Opioids are the fourth most common drugs that people seek treatment for in New South Wales. So that's about 5% of all treatment episodes um, from the last um, reporting survey that was done last year. And we have about 1.3% um, of people that reported that they used um, these drugs in, um, in New South Wales in um, the 2019 survey. We saw the non-medical um, use of pharmaceutical drugs went down between the 2016 and 2019 survey. And this was basically due, um, what one hypothesis that um, many people believe that this is due to is the reclassifying of codeine. So you needed a, a doctor's prescription to be able to get that. Um, so most, I'll talk first about heroin before we talk about um, the uh, pharmaceutical opioids. So most of the heroin that we get in Australia comes from Southeast Asia. Um, so from the Golden Triangle, so up near Myanmar um, and Thailand. Um, it's specifically manufactured for injecting. So um, um, more so, so most of the heroin in the world is produced in Afghanistan region. Um, and that's a brown heroin, and that mainly goes over to, um, to Europe and America. But we have ours mainly from Southeast Asia. So it looks like um, white or off-white rock or brown beige in colour. Uh, and these are both the rock and the powder are soluble in water, which can be injected. Um, as I said before, it's much more, um, if you smoke it or snort it or swallow it, you've got far less chance of actually overdosing. So again, if we were talking about harm reduction, we would recommend that people use this way. Uh, I guess it's very hard for people once they've started to inject to go to using a different way because the high won't be as intense as if you injected it. Um, this is from the, um, the in, in, uh, illicit drug reporting survey, which is conducted every year for, by the National Drug and Alcohol Research Center. Uh, and this is a sentinel use uh, you, um, sentinel survey of people who inject drugs and they um, reported how much it costs. So you can buy it in a point, which is um, 0.1 of a gram and it ranges in New South Wales between anywhere between 50 to $75 uh, per point or um, $50 per cap. Um, or you can buy it in a gram, which uh, ranges from 250 to $400 and averages around $350. Um, you can also buy prescription opioids like oxycodone on the street, um, and these range anywhere between $40 to $50 for uh, an 80 milligram tablet. Um, and I guess these are some of the slang names um, that um, people use to, um, to describe uh, heroin or opioid drugs. So these are some of the short-term effects of it. So again, um, these drugs provide uh, euphoria. Um, they're also very good for pain relief. Um, people can often get nauseous and vomit from them, and particularly the first time um, they use these drugs, um, people might, um, it's got such a strong central nervous system um, uh, depressant, so people can get quite nauseous and vomit. Um, they can also cause sleepiness and drowsiness, and this is often referred to as people being on the nod. So they're not actually sort of sleeping, um, they're just, um, you know, um, feeling quite drowsy. Um, opioid drugs tend to, um, people tend to get narrow pupils, whereas if people are using stimulant drugs, they tend to get uh, wide open uh, pupils. Um, breathing can um, be, um, can be uh, reduced significantly, uh, can reduce uh, blood pressure and the pulse rate, and people can become unconscious and they can overdose. And this, as we said, can be fatal or non-fatal. Some of the long-term effects of it um, is, uh, uh, you know, dependence. So we might remember from the first seminar that I talked about about one in four or five people who try um, heroin or opiate drugs become dependent on it. Um, that's the same with the opioid drugs. They found that in America, studies in America have found that one, one to about 20% of people who prescribed opioids go on to um, become dependent on them. So 
um, it's really, and I'll talk a little bit more about real-time prescribing later on uh, in the presentation. Um, people can experience heart and lung problems. Um, withdrawal can be um, really problematic, um, that people can get constipated. Um, and often when they withdraw from the drugs, then they can have the opposite effect of it. Um, people can get tooth decay, menstrual uh, irregularities. It can also, if they've been used long-term, cause infertility um, in women and loss of sex drive in both men and women. Obviously, um, if people are injecting the drugs, um, you can get infected with HIV and, or other bloodborne viruses. So we were one of the first countries in the world to introduce needle and syringe programs when we had about 5% of the population, of the injecting population with, uh, um, infected with HIV, we have now about 1% of injecting population uh, infected with HIV. So this saved uh, Australia a lot of money, um, the introduction of this. And this is when we were a real leader in harm reduction in the world. Um, people can also get damaged veins and bacterial infections and absences from uh, injecting. And obviously the drug is quite expensive um, and sometimes people might need to commit crime to be able to support um, their, their habits. Um, and people can also get um, malnutrition because they're generally not really looking after themselves and remembering to eat and that sort of um, thing too. I know there's a lot of information on this slide and I apologize for that, um, but this is basically um, the, uh, what a withdrawal um, feels like for someone who is dependent on opioid drugs. Um, so about one in four or five, as I said, um, become dependent on it. Um, and the withdrawal symptoms generally commence um, within 12 hours of taking the last dose. And these are like the opposite effects of what it's like um, when people feel high. Uh, people are high on them. So people can get a runny nose uh, and eyes, excessive sneezing, sweating, goosebumps, which is why people often talk about, um, you know, uh, going cold turkey. Uh, it's because their skin, their skin, they feel very cold. Um, and we can get hot and cold flushes and a loss of appetite. So even though a lot of these symptoms are pretty kind of um, horrible to have a uh, withdrawal from opioid drugs, unlike benzodiazepines or alcohol is not life-threatening. Um, most of the physical symptoms will settle down after a week. However, many people continue to experience ongoing problems related to sleep and appetite and particularly craving um, for the drug. Um, so again, um, after, after a week, most people will feel a lot better. So just want to talk a little bit about some harm redu uh, reduction initiatives for people who inject drugs. So as I said, Australia was one of the first countries to um, bring in needle and syringe programs um, when we had HIV on our doorstep. And what I find quite interesting now with COVID on our um, doorstep is that this is, it almost takes a virus before we're nice to people who inject drugs, or we certainly implement policies, good policies for people who inject drugs. Um, so these programs were um, introduced in 1986. The first program was um, set up in Redfern in, um, in Sydney, uh, and it was illegal. Um, and then um, basically by 1987, um, these started to roll out in um, many jurisdictions in New South Wales and the rest of um, Australia. Um, we also have opioid pharma pharmacotherapy treatment. Now, this isn't for everybody, um, but it certainly um, has been shown to um, reduce um, deaths and also to get people to, um, to be able to um, work and, and uh, contribute to society again. And we have a number of different pharmacotherapies in Australia. The main one that most people probably would have been heard about is methadone, um, which has been around since about the mid-1960s. We also have peer education or outreach programs, and this is where um, current or ex-drug users um, go out and educate people who um, are, um, are opiate dependent and provide them with needles and syringes if they can't um, <clears throat> access them through needle and syringe programs. We also have diversion uh, programs and caution schemes, um, and we also have medically supervised injecting rooms. So the first one that was set up in the Southern Hemisphere was in, um, in Sydney or King's Cross region, and this was opened in 2001. So we just celebrated the 20th year of that. Um, we have another one that opened in 2018 in, in Richmond, um, in Melbourne, 
and they've got another one opening up in the city um, there um, next year. And then we also have naloxone or Narcan, which is an amazing drug um, which can reverse the effects of an opioid uh, overdose. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, if people want more information about where you can get Narcan, please contact the New South Wales Users and AIDS Association um, because this is um, you can get you can get um, free access to um, Narcan or naloxone. So the aims of pharmacotherapy treatment, and again, this is quite kind of controversial at the time where it started, is basically to reduce or to stop if people want to um, using illicit drugs. Um, another thing uh, that we um, that it's good for is reducing the risk of virus transmission, so HIV, hepatitis C or B, minimise the risk of an overdose, um, try to reduce hazardous drug use and reduce criminal behaviour. And I guess switch users from a drug that's injected to a non-injected drug. Um, so a lot of these drugs are swallowed or put under the tongue, although we now have a new game changer with depo um, buprenorphine. Um, it's also really good for maintaining contact with people who inject drugs. So um, thankfully with the new um, pharmacotherapies that are available now, um, like uh, Budavol, um, the people um, only need to come in for treatment um, once a week or once a month, depending on what form of it they use. Um, we can also provide counselling, referral and treatment. Um, they generally stabilise um, people who use drugs live, so improve their emotional and physical health and social functioning and relationship and improve their economic status and employment. So it means that they can um, go and uh, work now. So the main pharmacotherapies we have available um, through the opioid pharmacotherapy programs in Australia are methadone, um, which as I said, is a synthetic uh, opioid. So this lasts about 24 hours. Um, and basically, um, you know, again, usually when people start this drug, they'll come in for dosing every day. Uh, although with more stable clients, they are given takeaway doses and certainly with COVID, um, now people, uh, many more people are able to um, get takeaway scripts for it. Uh, buprenorphine or Subutex, as it's, uh, it's known, it's been around for about 15 years. Um, and then we had um, buprenorphine and naloxone, um, which came out about 10 years ago. Uh, and basically this contains three parts uh, buprenorphine and one part naloxone. So buprenorphine tends to last about between one to three days. Um, Suboxone, so uh, which as I said, was brought in about 10 years ago. Um, basically the reason that they brought this one out is because if you inject it, is to avoid people injecting this drug. Um, because if you inject this one, um, people will go into rapid withdrawal because of the naloxone uh, contact, content in it. Uh, now, depot buprenorphine, so we've got Budavol and Subucade, and these um, basically became available or listed under the PBS uh, in September 2019. Um, and these are long acting, uh, as I said, uh, injectable drugs. Um, and so, um, sorry, I was, um, uh, um, uh, yes, yeah, so these are um, injected under the skin. Um, so Budavol comes in, a, uh, you can either, this comes in two forms. So it usually, most people will start off with one week um, and then maybe later if it works for them, be, um, go on to one month. Um, and Budavol is, um, it can be, it's usually under the skin, uh, usually in the stomach or the um, upper arm or the thigh. Uh, and Subucade is only um, a monthly uh, version of it. And it's um, basically only object, uh, in, uh, injected into the stomach. So this slowly dissolves and um, keeps people essentially from going into withdrawal. Um, countries like um, Germany and uh, also the UK also um, basically give heroin um, and to um, people who inject drugs. And that's basically for people who've tried every other form of treatment and that hasn't been out and hasn't worked. Um, so we had the Swiss heroin trial, which has been uh, happened about 20 years ago. So this isn't available in Australia. So the UK um, and Germany and Switzerland are where you, where you can get heroin if you are dependent on it. But the disadvantage of this one is that it's much more short acting than all of these others, which are much more long acting um, 
thing. So if you want more information about um, depobuprenorphine, um, basically, uh, if you go onto the Your Room website or the New South Wales Users and AIDS Association, they have really good information available. This is a poster um, that you can provide to clients if they are interested in um, getting uh, dosed with this one. So just quickly, some harm reduction information around um, opioid drugs. So it's really important not to mix these with other central nervous system depressants. Um, one of the things that we advise people is to take a bit first um, because there's very high um, purity and, and um, very variable purity and content in heroin in Australia uh, and in many co uh, countries because obviously it's illegal. Um, so again, you know, um, and this is where a lot of overdose happens is people um, suddenly have a lot stronger heroin than they were used to. Um, be aware of reduced tolerance. So this can happen after people have detoxed or they've been to rehab or they've been released to prison and often they'll go back to using the same amount that they used before. Um, they'd had some time off and um, time away from heroin. Uh, and again, this can be really dangerous for overdose. Uh, if we can encourage people to smoke or snort or swallow it or even shaft it um, so you can put it up your bum, um, it's much less um, risky for overdose. Um, it's also much more risky, as we said before, you know, people can get vein damage and bloodborne viruses and other bacterial infections. It's really, really important that people don't share any form of the injecting equipment. So not only needles and syringes, some people will often share the mix um, or the water or the swabs or the filters or tourniquets um, and because basically this is particularly dangerous for um, hepatitis C transmission because we have a lot more prevalence of that in the population than we do of HIV here. So always use a clean um, needle and syringe um, or the clean equipment for every um, new hit. Uh, and you can get sterile syringes from pharmacies and NSPs in Australia really important not to use alone um, and don't leave people to sort of sleep it off. And again, really important if you're um, working with older drug users that to be aware of the health related risk factors that contribute to overdose. Um, so if they might have liver or lung disease, um, this it can increase the chances of. And um, know the signs of an overdose and how to respond. So if you're living in an area where there is some um, high um, use of the drug, it's really important um, that if you can carry naloxone so that you know how to respond to that uh, and carry it with you. And I'll talk a little bit more about that afterwards. Okay, so we're just going to talk about benzodiazepines. So um, because this is also a drug that's often used by injecting drug users, and um, particularly when there's not a lot of uh, opioid drugs available. Um, so there's many different forms of benzodiazepines. Um, the common ones that most people have probably heard of are Valium and, and Xanax. Uh, and these, these are more popularly used uh, these days. Normazin and Mogadon Serapax are sort of the the um, older generation uh, type of benzodiazepines. So there are a group of drugs that are called um, minor tranquilizers. Um, there's many brand names of them and there's about 30 different types or generic names of them uh, that are available uh, in Australia. Um, they're usually used to treat anxiety and insomnia, um, but they've also been used to treat epilepsy and also alcohol withdrawal and agitation um, with serious psychiatric disorders. They're obviously legal if they're prescribed and used that way, um, but they're illegal to use if they're sold or provided to someone without a prescription. And as I said before, um, you know, um, you can buy, um, often, you know, people will use these drugs if there are uh, other um, uh, opioid drugs available. We are finding the um, use of these drugs are on the increase in Australia, and certainly we are finding that these are often um, found in many overdoses. Um, they are usually swallowed, but they can be ground into a powder and mixed with water and injected. Um, and they're involved with about one quarter of overdose deaths in Australia. So you can see here that you can buy um, Valium for about $5 on the street or Xanax for about $10 um, if it's used. Now, um, the problem I guess with Valium is that it has a very long half-life up to 24 hours. And basically that means that um, within 24 hours, half of the drug will be reduced or eliminated out of your system. So Valium can be um, active in a person's system to up to four to five days. 
Xanax has a shorter half-life, um, so it ranges anywhere um, between six to 24 hours. So usually within two to four days, um, the drug is out of the system. Um, so again, that's really important to also um, remember as far as overdose. So usually within 30 minutes of swallowing benzos or almost immediately if they're injected, people will start to feel uh, relaxed and sleepy and maybe have a lack of energy. Um, some people could get uh, dizzy. Um, if you use quite a lot of them, you can feel uh, euphoria. Um, again, in higher doses, people can get confused and visual distortions, uh, moodiness, and can also have some um, short-term um, memory loss. Um, I guess one of the main problems with these drugs is that they um, cause dependence. And this can happen within two to three weeks of using um, benzodiazepines and daily use of it. Um, and again, uh, a benzo withdrawal can be life-threatening. So if you're working with clients that are using these drugs and are dependent on them, it's really important that they see a doctor before or a medical practitioner or um, you know, access a withdrawal unit um, to, um, to stop using them. Um, people can also feel uh, anxiety and irritability and paranoia and, and aggression and depression um, once they've been using them long-term. Um, they can experience muscle weakness and rashes and nausea, and they can also um, increase their weight. Uh, again, like opioid drugs, they can have, um, you know, menstrual irregularities in women and sexual problems in both men and women. And again, long-term um, use of them can cause memory loss, cognitive impairment, uh, dementia, and also falls. And this is just um, because of the disinhibiting effects of it. Um, and confusion and lethargy and sleep problems. So the very reason that you might be using in the first place can conversely happen when people get into um, long-term uh, use of these, um, these types of drugs. So other things to consider with these drugs, are, again, um, they're addictive and should only be taken short-term. So again, and that's why they're often prescribed uh, short-term by a doctor. Uh, tolerance and withdrawal can occur, occur within two to three weeks of daily use. And again, as I said before, um, you know, some uh, drugs can stay in the, um, you know, work in the body for longer lengths of time. So Valium, three to five days um, can stay in your blood. Um, people who use high doses of benzos um, or using them for a long time should definitely seek medical advice before tapering down or stopping use. Um, and people can experience some um, seizures if they stop using them, which is similar to what happens with alcohol. And um, some of the common uh, withdrawal effects associated with them are insomnia, anxiety, and irritability. Again, the opposite effects of why people might be, have started using them in the first place. Um, and other symptoms can in, include headaches and nausea and tremor and sweating and loss of appetite and visual and hearing disturbances uh, and hallucinations, which isn't a nice thing. And again, um, it's not good if you're injecting these drugs. So we used to, um, and this was up to 10 years ago, um, NSP used to provide pill filters. Um, and you, I think you can buy them in some ph pharmacies again now, um, but people can get a lot of vein or limb damage as a result of injecting them, um, you know, and uh, so it's really important to, um, to be, um, provide some good advice to people around um, and certainly trying to use pill filters if they're going to be injecting benzodiazepines. And this is why Serapax was taken off the market because uh, Kirkton Road was noticing with a lot of their clients that they um, started to have quite um, bad uh, losing limbs and stuff um, because um, they were injecting benzodiazepines. So again, really important not to mix these with other central nervous system depressants because this is like a double um, effect on the uh, central nervous system. Um, so drugs like alcohol or gamma hydroxybutrate or opioids or heroin or sedative drugs like Xanax um, greatly increases the chance of a fatal overdose if you're mixing. Don't use them uh, longer than two to three weeks. Um, and if you want to stop um, or cut down, go and see to a, uh, speak to a medical professional or go to, with, or check, or go to withdrawal uh, unit. And again, um, make sure you filter your mix or um, use clean in, and use clean injecting equipment. And um, also be careful with driving with these drugs because they can slow your reaction time um, uh, while you're driving. Um, so it's really important not to drive. And again, uh, be aware of this, um, the, the impact of that can have um, a long time. 
So as I said, um, new I have some really good information uh, available about COVID-19 and harm reduction advice. Uh, and particularly, um, as I said, one of my best friends works at the MSIC at the moment. They've noticing a lot less clients accessing the service again because of uh, lockdown. Um, and so it's um, really important to make sure that um, people um, have enough um, injecting equipment on the site, they have enough uh, uh, naloxone on board, um, or they've got enough takeaway doses. Um, so again, really important to speak to your opiate treatment program um, to see if you can get takeaway doses. And it'd be really important that these type of things remain after COVID ha um, has been and gone, which was probably gonna be a long time on our doorstep. Uh, and again, um, because it would be nice if we um, were able to keep some of these measures in place for people who are injecting drugs. Um, so again, these posters are available on the newer website. One of the things I just want to talk about quickly is real-time prescribing and monitoring, which has been happening in um, the ACT in Victoria and Tasmania for a while. Um, uh, basically, this is coming to New South Wales. Uh, it's rumoured to be happening uh, already in two LHDs in August. And basically, this is used to track medic medicines associated with high risk of harm. So this basically includes mainly opioid drugs and, um, and benzodiazepines. And it works by notifying prescribing doctors and also pharmacists when the patient's been previously prescribed with a high risk drug. So it's going to be trialled into LHDs before it's rolled out full time in New South Wales. Um, and it's rumoured to be starting in August. Um, so that's in a couple of days. Um, but uh, basically, if you want further information about this, um, NADA will keep its members informed as to when uh, it happens. There've been some issues with it um, sort of starting off um, and certainly they're learning from the trials that have happened in, in um, Tasmania and Victoria and ACT. Um, and it takes a while for this to, um, to get into place, but it certainly is coming into New South Wales. So just want to talk, um, end up by talking about uh, naloxone or Narcan. Um, some of you have probably um, heard about this or already prescribing it um, or recommending it for use to your clients that are injecting. Also really important in, um, for this to happen with people that have been using um, drugs for pain relief. Um, so we have two different versions of it available. The Pronoxad was the first version that was available in Australia and it was an intramuscular um, drug. Um, and then we have Nixoid, which is an intranasal um, drug, um, which is the um, far more, uh, and this has only been available for a couple of years, but this is the one that is um, being uh, used a lot more um, these days. So I just want to have a quick poll about um, Narcan. Some of you um, may well have um, uh, been uh, uh, prescribing it or, or recommending it to your um, clients. So I've just um, re um, uh, okay, I'm going to um, put this poll up. So on average, what is the onset of action of naloxone? So how long does it take before naloxone works is essentially what this uh, question's asking. Is it one minute, two to five minutes, three to, uh, six, sorry, six to 10, 11 to 15 or over 16 minutes? I'll leave it open for another five seconds for those of you who haven't answered. Uh, okay, gonna close it off now. Share the results. Uh, congratulations for those of you who picked two to five minutes, this is the correct answer. Um, if it were, uh, and this is, so within two to five minutes, you should see a person who has used opioid drugs um, basically come out of their, um, out of their um, overdose. Um, if it's not, if you're not seeing that, we would advise after, th after three minutes to re-administer um, the drug. So thank you very much for answering that one. All right, and this is the one that's available. So this is Nixoid, this is available, and this comes in two sprays. So this is more commonly um, used or distributed now by um, NSPs. Um, and or the New South Wales Users and AIDS Association. You can also buy it at pharmacists. Uh, and this comes in two sprays. And I've got a little DVD to show you about that. So it's been used for over 40 years in emergency medicine to reverse the effect of opiate overdoses. So basically ambulance used to carry this with them 
um, and it's, um, it's a short acting opioid with high affinity for the immune opioid receptor. And basically what that does is it knocks the opioid drugs from the um, mu receptor and reverses the effect of an opioid overdose. It can um, cause withdrawal in opiate users. Um, and basically, you know, I guess the thing is that some people can be a bit angry when you've um, reversed the effect of opiate overdose um, because they're no longer feeling the, um, you know, the nice effect that the opioid's given them, even though you may well have, um, you know, saved their life. It has no effects in non-opiate users. So um, that's why it's, uh, it's a really good drug. Um, to use so um, for people who uh, use opioids. So if people are not opioid users, they won't get any sort of a buzz from it. So the first trials of um, peer administered opioid um, uh, naloxone were started in the ACT in 2012, and then in uh, New South Wales in 2013. And the World Health Organization basically in 2014 recommended that we made naloxone available for people who are likely to witness an opiate overdose. Um, and it's also uh, in the national drug strategy to increase um, access to it. Um, uh, look again, uh, because it's been, uh, it was starting to be used in many countries already in the early 2000s, was provided to people who use uh, injecting drug, uh, who are injecting uh, people who inject drugs. Um, but it took about 10 to 12 years before we actually had the first trials available in Australia. So again, you know, this is where we were a real laggard in harm reduction in Australia, and we really should have had this available a lot longer, um, a, lot, a lot quicker than it actually took. Um, so this is the um, Pronoxad. So this is the um, first um, trials that were done were with Pronoxad, um, and this um, contains basically five ampules. Uh, with uh, with in injections in it. Um, it's a bit more complicated to use than the um, nasal spray. Um, so, um, but in the Nixoid, you basically have two forms of the nasal spray available. Um, whereas in the uh, Pronoxad, um, we've got five um, versions of it available. Both are listed on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and it costs approximately $41 on the PBS and you can buy it from a pharmacist, but again, Many people who inject drugs probably don't have a lot of money to afford this and you can get it from uh, needle and syringe programs for free. So um, basically the New South Wales alcohol and drug sector is working to increase take home naloxone uh, and provide access to clients. So um, there's a great paper that's about to come out um, from the first trials that were done, um, which were run by the Langton Centre. Mm -hmm. And what they did was basically provide training to people who work in NSP programs and also treatment programs. And they credentialed them to be able to provide information to um, about how naloxone works to peers that um, access their programs. Um, and then gave them uh, naloxone so that they were able to administer it in the case that they were with someone who um, overdosed. So the New South Wales legislation provides specific protections for Good Samaritans to administer naloxone. Um, so basically um, you won't get charged if someone dies. And if you want further information about the program, it's available on the Your Room website um, there. So if you just put in naloxone New South Wales Health, you'll, provide, you'll find new, um, information about it. And that's what it looks like um, for, for you if you want um, further information about how to use it. So again, uh, not going to spend too much time on this one because this one is not so much used in New South Wales anymore, but it's, uh, and some people don't like using needles, which is why the um, nasal version uh, was available. The trials for the nasal version took a bit longer um, to come out, which is why this was available um, first. Um, and I guess it requires some skill to assemble and give the intramuscular injection. Um, for it, but this was um, the first trials that we had of it. We're using the Pronoxad. So as it said, it takes five, it contains five doses, onset of action. So basically within two to five minutes of administering it, um, you should see that the person's overdose um, uh, basically um, reverses um, and it can basically, uh, has an effect of 30 to ni uh, 90 minutes and redose if there's no response after two to three minutes. Uh, and this can be um, basically put into the thigh or the upper outer quad or the butt or into the shoulder. Um, 
Uh, so this is our Nixoid. So, and I've got a little uh, DVD that I'm going to show you in a minute. So this was available a bit later, um, so 2019, and it was uh, listed, uh, sorry, January 2019, and it was listed on the PBS in not October 2019. So we've had it basically for a couple of years. Uh, it contains two um, sprays, so um, one spray and one, one, one spray equals one dose. And it's really important not to test, and a lot of people do that, is to see whether or not it actually works, because basically if you do that, you waste a dose of it. Um, before you administer um, this form of it, make sure that the nose is clear. Hold the device with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and the first and middle fingers on either side of the novel nozzle and um, redose again after two to three minutes if it's not um, using. And the products basically got clear and simple uh, instructions. If you Google um, how it works, there's some um, great videos available, but I'll show you one of them now, um, which um, Sun's going to show you because up in the Northern Rivers, uh, we don't have good internet reception here. So Sun, if you could play this, that would be great. And this just shows you how it actually works. Hi, I'm going to go through how to use Naloxone nasal spray Nixoid. So Nixoid is a needle-free, ready-to-use formulation of Naloxone, which reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. Firstly, if you think someone has overdosed, call emergency services, followed by administering the Nixoid. From here, you'll put the person on their back, peeling back the package and removing the nasal spray from the package. Make sure not to test it by pushing down this button prior to administering, as there is only one dose per nasal spray. As the person is lying down, support their head and administer the naloxone one spray up the nostril. The naloxone is gonna be absorbed through the skin lining within the nostril. Pop the person in the recovery position, lying on their side, and wait with them until emergency services arrive. Monitor the person's breathing, and if someone isn't responding to the naloxone within two to three minutes, or four minutes that that person is pregnant, administer another dose of the nasal spray in the other nostril. After that person comes to and wakes up, it's really important that they don't use for another few hours because they may drop again. So stay with them for as long as possible and reiterate this message. Great, thanks for that, Son. I hope that, so that's available on YouTube from the Pennington Institute if you want to have a look at it um, more. Uh, if you are interested in um, seeing more about how this, um, drugs work, uh, these drugs work, there's uh, information available. And um, again, we'll, provide it, we'll be provided with a um, PDF copy of the PowerPoint so that you can click on these links and um, see how the uh, different drugs work. Okay, so we're just going to talk a little bit before we end on the signs and symptoms uh, of an overdose. So again, it's really important, even if you're administering naloxone, that you do call an ambulance, uh, as, they, as they said. Okay, so basically the recovery position, which many um, people will uh, already know. So this basically supports the hand and the head and the knee stops the person from um, rolling onto their um, stomach. So again, if you, um, if, if, you have a, if you see somebody who's overdosed or you know that they're using opioid drugs, you can also check their pupils because they'll basically be pinpoints. Um, so again, like the, the top of a pin. If their skin is pale in color, again, this is basically showing that there's a lack of oxygen um, coming into the system. So they'll get a bluish tinge to their lips or their nose or their nails or their fingertips. Um, if they don't respond to noise, so when you, um, you know, might shake them or shout at them, um, you know, this is again uh, signifying that they're basically going into an overdose. Um, so if they've lost consciousness so, uh, and you, they can't be woken, then basically this is uh, a time to uh, administer naloxone. So if their breathing is slow or shallow, um, if they're snoring or rasping, rasping sounds or they're not breathing at all, really, really important to call an ambulance and administer naloxone. So naloxone is basically used for opioids, but it does have a little bit of effect also on benzo. So it's not designed for benzodiazepines, but it may well, um, you know, studies have shown that it does also uh, sometimes also work for benzodiazepines and particularly if they've got the both on board. 
So again, really important to call for an ambulance, monitor their breathing and their consciousness, um, use a recovery per permission, stay with them till help arise and give, um, and if you're using opiates, give naloxone. Really important that message that they said and the, um, also on, the, uh, on that little video we showed um, that you encourage the people, um, you know, not to use opioids for about 90 minutes afterwards, because again, this could mean that they could um, drop again or overdose. And we obviously don't want that to kind of happen. So that's the end of these um, presentations um, for you. I just wanted to conclude with just the cost of alcohol and other drugs to Australia. So this is basically from 2011. Um, so it's 10 years ago. But you can see that um, the cost of alcohol, tobacco and other drugs was estimated to be about $56 billion um, in, in Australia. And this is basically incorporates the health and the hospital system costs, loss of workplace productivity, road accidents and also crime. So tobacco costs us the most amount of money. So even though we might get some uh, excise um, from uh, you know, tobacco because we are the most expensive place in the world to buy uh, tobacco related products, um, it uh, costs about 56% of that total uh, budget. I don't know if people saw this week that Philip Morris Tobacco has basically made a, um, said that in the next 10 years, they're gonna phase out smoking. Uh, and I think that's because they've also invested a lot into vaping. Um, and they are, Philip Morris Tobacco owns the Jewel, uh, which is the uh, most efficient way that you can uh, administer, um, uh, I guess, sort of nicotine product. Uh, it has the same action as smoking. So I thought that was quite interesting is that they've now decided that their product kills too many people, um, but they've uh, invested quite heavily in the vaping market. And so I think we've got a lot more problems and we discussed this a lot in the second webinar. So even though we recoup about um, $7 billion in tax from alcohol, we're about $8 billion out of pocket with this one. Uh, and again, you can see how much the illegal drugs in Australia cost us in health, uh, road accidents, and productivity. So far more than the, all the illegal drugs put together, um, which is about um, just under 15% at $8 billion. Um, anyway, um, I'm happy to take any questions. What I might just do just before people, uh, before we do the questions is just to provide a little bit of information about um, where you can go for further information about it. Again, I plugged this at the last few sessions. Um, this is a really good resource um, about, it's uh, produced by the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre in about 2017. It's been updated since then, um, but it, it provides a really good summary and it's all evidence-based uh, information. Um, your Room, which is great, got really good information, less so on harm reduction advice, but will give you a little, you know, a uh, bit of information around short and long-term harms associated with the drugs. Um, ADDIS is where you would go to for um, you know, information um, about what type of services are available. Again, most of you work in drug and alcohol services, so um, I'm sure you're aware of um, ADDIS. Um, the Alcohol and Drug Foundation also has some really good information and pictures available uh, about alcohol and drugs. They also have some um, information available about real-time prescribing. It's called Safe Script, and I think it'll be called Safe Script also in New South Wales. Um, so if you want further information around real-time monitoring and what's happened in Victoria around that, they've got some great information available on their website. Again, um, the ASSIST, which is um, the uh, alcohol, um, this screens for all different types of drugs, has um, about 10 uh, about, uh, different uh, information available on what is the drug, how much does it cost, what does it look like, short and long-term effects, um, things to consider and harm reduction advice. And this is available on the ASSIST portal uh, under resources, uh, ASSIST tools um, there, so you can get good information available about that. Harm Reduction Victoria also provides some really good um, resources available for um, people particularly who might be uh, injecting drugs. And also don't forget about the New South Wales Users and AIDS Association, which provides really good information on um, particularly relevant for New South Wales. All right, questions. Uh, so our first question was, can a seizure during a drug affected episode cause brain damage? Yes. 
Yes, and that's why you need a medicated withdrawal and it can also cause death. So that's the biggest danger with it. Uh, it's like a stroke, a seizure. Um, the next question was, can you OD if you are taking Xanax only? An AOD worker has informed me in the past that you can only overdose if Xanax is used in conjunction with another substance. Hmm, that's a really good question. I might have to take that one notice. I think I would say it's it's much well. It's obviously much more likely um, to happen with um, again uh, other central nervous system depressants uh, on board. But I mean, if you take enough of anything, you can basically overdose. But I might um, have to get back to you uh, on that one. I'm happy to Google it and um, get back to you afterwards. Um, unless anybody else online knows or can answer that question. Uh, we might give people some time to respond and then in the yeah. meantime, on to the next question. Um, so which category does Suboxone fall under? Uh, so that's basically, Suboxone is uh, basically buprenorphine mixed with naloxone. So that's basically a, a central nervous system depressant drug. It's a pharmacotherapy uh, drug that's used to treat opioid dependence. Um, but the, and that was introduced about 10 years ago. And again, this was to stop people from diverting um, drugs. Um, uh, you know, so often some people will, um, you know, will then sell their drugs on um, and then might inject them. And the, the, it was basically to stop people from injecting uh, those type of drugs, because if you were to inject Suboxone uh, because of the Naloxone, it will send you into rapid withdrawal. Um, and just going off that, how can people be supported to continue their Suboxone program if they've been incarcerated? A lot of, um, so a lot of, uh, so basically a lot of prisons, um, a lot of prisons will, um, will base, uh, are administering uh, opioid substitution. Um, so again, uh, that's a, that's a good question. And most prisons in New South Wales is, to my understanding, do have opioid um, treatment available in um, as part of their prison uh, program. So um, I, if they are on if they are on opiate substitution, that should continue if they are if they are incarcerated. But again, you know, it's, it's not always equally um, done. Um, and again, and again. Um, but yeah, yeah, that it should be happening. But, but that's a, that you know again, different prisons have different policies. But a lot of prisons in New South Wales are basically supporting opioid substitution um, for for uh, for people that are incarcerated. Um, the next question was: Is there any data on increasing the use of benzos within young populations? Oh, I mean, we are, we know there again, there's been a huge increase in the amount of prescribing of benzos, again, similar to the opioid drugs. Um, I guess there, um, and we are again with seeing, um, particularly with COVID happening at the moment, are seeing many more people obviously suffering from, uh, you know, mental health issues. So uh, again, you know, I guess a lot of, um, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, practitioners or GPs would probably be loath to be prescribing benzo, you know, Valium and, and that sort of um, thing to their clients. But I guess we are seeing, we have seen, you know, similar to the rates of increase with the opioid drugs, um, you know, an increase in um, the prescription of, um, of, yeah, of, of benzodiazepines in Australia. So, and I guess with a lot of, particularly with a lot of young people suffering with their mental health, we would see an increase in that. But I, I don't have a real, um, I'm happy to take that one on notice and, um, and provide further information about that one. If you want to email me after that session, uh, after this session, I'll, I'll put up my email and um, I can find out for you. But I know there has certainly been an increase in the, in the amount of people that are receiving uh, benzo prescriptions and with the amount of young people, uh, I'd expect that would have been increased as well. Okay. And what do you think will be the impact of the RTPM in New South Wales? Yeah, um, look, I think this is this is one. I think this will be um, 
and that's why New South Wales has been a little bit slow to um, to introduce it in um, you know New South Wales because again there's a lot of implications for people who are using drugs for pain um, and um, you know it's a it's a challenge for people that are obviously you know legitimately using these drugs and there's a lot of pressure on kind of doctors um, around the, um, this sort of thing so and you know part of the problem that we have is that you know the GP consultations aren't really um, you know long um, and again, you know, if people are really interested more in this, there's the, um, the clinical innovation, uh, the Agency for Clinical Innovation, ACI, um, run the pain network, and they've got a lot of really good resources on their website um, on that. Um, so there's, there's good information on that. But I, I think, um, you know, they've certainly seen some um, problems happening in other um, jurisdictions, um, which is why it's been a little bit slow off the mark here. Um, and again, you know, we're just needing to get all the ducks in a line before it will actually start in real time. And again, that's why they're going to trial it in two LHDs first um, before it gets rolled out full time in, in New South Wales. Um, and then someone, just going back to um, Suboxone for a minute, um, yep. what is the likely impact on an individual if they're smoking Suboxone and consuming alcohol each day? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, the, because alcohol is a central nervous system depressant and so is Suboxone, you are increasing your risk of overdose um, with those two because, again, it's like a double depressant effect on your central nervous system. So again, I would be um, you know, providing information about risk of overdose and, and particularly about mixing the two. I would also be recommending that they have Narcan available or Naloxone available uh, in case um, you know, of overdose um, and just having that conversation um, with them. So you know, again, it's much more dangerous if you're mixing two, two central nervous system depressants together um, and we see that, you know, I think 75% of overdose deaths have two, um, overdose, two central nervous system depressants on, worth, on, on board. And most commonly that's, well, we are seeing the amount of people using four um, different substances at the same time increasing, but opioids and benzos are, you know, are particularly dangerous to be mixing together um, with that. And alcohol, many people don't even realize that that's a drug. Um, and so that's just naturally consumed at the same time with it. But again, you know, once you have more central nervous system depressants, your chances of overdosing are much, much higher than just sticking to one drug. Uh, someone's also asked, where can they find more information regarding Suboxone and its street value? Um, so I would look at the New South Wales Users and AIDS Association um, website. Uh, I would also look at Harm Reduction Victoria. They might have some information available there. Um, uh, if you just want information about Suboxone in itself, you can find information about that on the New South Wales Health Your Room website. Um, and again, you know, they, they provide fairly generic information around kind of mixing of those drugs, but I would probably go to Newar. New South Wales Users and AIDS Association or Victoria because they work a lot more with people who inject drugs uh, and those type of, um, you know, and drugs that are commonly injected. Um, uh, but there also might be information. So there would be some clinical guidelines. If you put clinical guidelines around um, Suboxone, you might find a little bit more information uh, available also around that. Um, they just released just for those, I, I think a real game changer to be talking about with clients too with the opiate substitution is the butafol and subcutane um, because these have been really, the great thing about those is that, um, and this is particularly for people, um, you know, they only need to come in once a month for dosing, which is really good, um, you know, uh, information um, and really good for clients. Um, you know, they don't have to come in every day for dosing around that. But um, yeah, okay. so I would try those two websites. And then the last question is in regard to Targan and Endone, um, a medication for pain, are there any signs that workers should be looking for in terms of addiction? I guess, um, so, 
Yeah, good question. I mean, if if um, I mean, obviously, if people are using them daily, then they're you know dependence can happen on those drugs similar to benzos if they're using them daily and have used them for a couple of two to three weeks in a row. So again, that would be you know a sign that um, you know someone's you know dependent on on the drug. Um, I, so I'd be having a conversation about that um, with the with the with the client. Um, what else was it again, Sun? Can you repeat? So in regards to target and endo and medication for pain, are there any signs as workers that we should look for in terms of addiction? Yeah, yeah. Well, I would. I mean, look. Basically, I, again, you know, this this will be something that will come up with a real time prescribing of them, and uh, you know, again. I mean, part of the problem that they had in America, and this is where we started to see fentanyl really becoming a really big problem in America, is when they introduced the real-time prescribing, about one in um, five people who were getting drugs for pain were suddenly cut off from their medications. And then they in turn went to um, the black market um, to try and um, you know, stop their withdrawal. Um, so it, I think some of the withdrawal symptoms that I showed that were in earlier in the slide would be, um, you know, important to um, to have a discussion about. Um, but you know, I, you know, I guess one of the the problems that one of the dangers that we have is that, and why we're certainly wanting to get some good things in place before the real time prescribing actually comes into effect is just that, you know, we don't suddenly turn people off, you know, legitimate pain medications, and then they therefore go to the black market. And certainly, you know, that's what we're starting to see is that a lot of people over in the US has started then, you know, um, and, uh, using illicit drugs, um, and then not being able to get, uh, and then, you know, um, become getting, uh, Getting fentanyl, so they've got a lot more fentanyl in their uh, in their um, street heroin than we um, do in Australia, which is a good thing uh, here. But yeah, I would um, certainly certainly have a conversation with them and, and be be aware, and maybe have the conversation that this is kind of coming uh, into effect, you know, shortly in New South Wales. Um, so um, yeah. Um, so we might leave it there because there aren't any more questions, but if anybody has any questions after the session, Annie's details will be included when the resources are sent around. Um, so feel free to email her. Um, but thank you so much, Annie, and thank you to all the participants who've, in, who've joined the series. Uh, we trust you found it valuable. Um, to anyone who's missed any of the webinars in the series, you can catch up on the NADA website or the AOD 101 webinars will be uploaded by the end of this week. Um, so you can catch up there. But other than that, thank you.